life is that way. They feel like they're kind of stuck in the situation, you know, against all odds. There's just no hope. There's no way to avoid the collision that's getting ready to take place. There's no way to get out of the problem that's approaching. Sooner or later, this thing's going to close in on me, and I'm doomed. I'm sunk, and I just don't see any particular way to get around or to get through or get in, in this situation to, to find a relief. You know, it's kind of like there's no hope. As maybe that's you today. Maybe maybe you're kind of going through that. Maybe you sense that in your own life, maybe in your own relationships, or maybe even in your own marriage, maybe in your finances. It just looks like, hey, this pretty much looks like sooner or later, the end's coming, and there's no answer for this situation. There's just no hope. As a Christian, let me remind you that God in the Scriptures is called the God of all hope. So never give in to the lies that say there is no hope. In Christ, he is, there is the hope that you need, the hope you're looking for, the hope of glory, the scripture calls it. There's hope. You say, well, Brother Joe, I mean, everything's broken. I've tried to fix everything around me. You know, I just, I just don't know. Hey, don't give up. It's not over yet. Yeah. There's one thing we've seen through this particular series of studies is you, you, you always have to account for the presence of God and for the grace of God and the mercy of God because he is he's available to us. Now, the world doesn't comprehend that. The world doesn't know how to deal with this, this, you know, this, this no hope scenario, all right? Uh, they might turn to a million different avenues, but they never find what they're looking for. Some turn to their horoscope and they think that somehow they're going to find uh, their solution and their answer in their horoscope. Others turn to the psychic hotline. You know, I've always figured those people are really psychic. They would know I was in trouble and they'd call me. <laughs> The psychic hotline offers no hope. You know, they, they get desperate. They open their Chinese fortune cookie even think that the answer might be there. Pick up some kind of self-help book at the store and there's it's just no hope there. The world doesn't offer hope. In fact, it really offers a scenario of doom and despair when you look at the world because in, in, in the Gospels and in the Scripture, it talks about a, a declining, deteriorating world that we live in. But even in the midst of that, and we see even an apex of that towards the end times, we know that in Christ there's always hope and there's always hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Where do you turn? You turn to the Lord. Who do you look to? You look to the Lord. What do you do? You trust the Lord. And that's, that's pretty much a, 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 a synopsis of what I've been saying through all these messages and even what I want to share with you today is found in the book of Luke in chapter 18. There's the story of Bartimaeus. Now, I think when we talked about the miracles of Jesus several years back. I, I brought this sermon out, but I want to look at a little different, a little different way today in this kind of against all odds scenario, because he really is a guy who's the perfect picture of being against all odds. It says, as Jesus was approaching Jericho, a blind man was sitting on the road by the road begging. And hearing the crowd going by, he began to inquire what this was. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. And he called out saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who led the way were sternly telling him, be quiet. But he kept crying out all the more, son of David, have mercy upon me. And Jesus stopped and commanded that he be brought to him. And when he came near, he questioned him, what do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he regained his sight and began following him, glorifying God. And when all the people saw it, they gave praise to God. This is a story of how one man's life was miraculously changed against all odds. There's not a lot of background information. This, this story is mentioned in several gospels, but everyone is so, so similar, you know, in so many different ways. You don't get all the background information. It does refer to him as the blind man. It's very specific in the Greek language to point out this is the blind man. So it, obviously, I think the people, at least of the community, knew who he was and what was going on, that this is Bartimaeus, the blind man, all right? Who's that guy? Oh, that's the blind man, that's Bartimaeus. So, you know, he had some recognition in the community, but not in a positive way. This guy is looked down upon most likely. He's a beggar, nobody wants to hear him, nobody wants to pay any attention to him. He's a guy, he's kind of the outcast of the culture and society. Uh, He's always out there, you know, he's, he's that homeless guy on the corner. There's really no hope for, everything's collapsed in his world. There's really no way out. I mean, he's blind. What's he gonna do for himself but sit out on the corner and beg? He kind of resigned to his, his, his conditions and his circumstance. There's a lot of people just like blind Bartimaeus in the world around us. Maybe that even you today, you're kind of in that same scenario. What's the use, what's the hope? This is all there is for me. If that's, 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 I just kind of learn how to cope. 
Now that's a popular word in the culture that we live in. Everybody wants to learn how just to cope. But in Christ, we don't cope, we hope, all right? We have hope, a sure expectation that God is involved in our life and God is committed to us. Luke says that Bartimaeus simply was blind. Now I, I can't even begin to fathom being blind, all right? And being in that kind of situation, in that kind of scenario where you can't picture us, the beauty of the world around you, you can't see the faces of those you love, this is a difficult situation. Not only is he blind, he's obviously, he's begging, so he doesn't have any money. He's poor, he's jobless, he's homeless, but he's simply surviving, simply getting by. There's a lot of people who fit that bill who have good jobs, all right? They make decent money in life, but they're just getting by. They may even have the economic means, but they're still in their life, they're living this kind of hopeless scenario without joy, without any real satisfaction that God wants to give them, without a real peace in their life. They're just, they're just there, no joy, no peace, no happiness, you know, just kind of concerned with just surviving. Let me just get through the day, you know, what can I get, what, 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 if I can just get by, I'll be okay. But I think as we've been looking at these messages on Against All Odds, and you look at Bartimaeus, there are some lessons that you can glean from him. In fact, there's three things I want you to capture today, and they're three simple things, all right? So even a guy like me can get a grip on them, all right? So I know there's hope for you if I can. So understand these three simple things can transform your life because they certainly did for Bartimaeus. And it went well beyond just his physical sight. So maybe you're in a situation today like the trains are headed down the same track and every avenue to find deliverance, release, or freedom has been exhausted. What do I do? How do I handle the situation? Well, the first of these three things is simple. Like Bartimaeus, I think you need to capitalize on the opportunity that God has provided for you right here and right now. It says that Bartimaeus called out saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, this is at the end of the ministry of Jesus, this event, all right? He's been serving in, in the ministry God had called him to, the Father had given him for three years. In fact, he's leaving the city of Jericho. He's just finished meeting with the tax collector, Zacchaeus, all right? He's just finished uh, uh, his, 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 his teaching and his preaching there. And now as he leaves Jericho, he's on his way up to Jerusalem and he's going to give himself as a sacrifice for all mankind's sin uh, at the cross in the crucifixion process. So here he is, he's leaving, and you know the cross is on his mind, you know, Jerusalem is on his mind, and here sits this beggar by the right wayside. I don't believe this is the first time that Bartimaeus has heard the name Jesus, all right? Jesus has passed this way before, and I'm sure everybody coming in and out of Jericho is talking about Jesus. Who is this guy, this Messiah? Thousands are being fed, blind eyes are being opened, the lame walk, the dead are raised. I mean, this is, this, is the, this is the news of the day. So he's hearing it, and I believe as people are coming in and going out, here he sits every day. This is not his first understanding of what, who this Jesus is. And he cries out, he takes this opportunity that's right here and right now. And by the way, this is a passing opportunity that won't come again for Bartimaeus, all right? It's not going to happen again. He has to seize this moment radically, quickly, immediately, or he's going to miss it completely. Bartimaeus senses that. I think he realizes that. And he hears the commotion. What's happening? What's going on? Jesus of Nazareth is passing this way. And he takes the opportunity that's presented to him in that moment and seizes it. Now, there's another story about a guy who's, that reminds me of here who had an opportunity and did not seize it. The story's told in the bark, book of Luke also, as well as in Mark, about the rich young ruler. You heard the story on the rich young ruler? All right. There's three things about the rich young ruler I like and I could hopefully identify with. Rich, young, ruler. <laughs> we all like that, right? Wouldn't it be nice to be rich, young, and a ruler? This guy had it all. It's all there. He's holding it in his hand. He's religious. He believes there's a God. He believes there's a heaven. He believes there's a hell. But he knows that even with his wealth, his status, and all the blessings of God on his life, that something is still not right. He knows that internally there's a collision coming. As we all do without Christ, we, I think that God puts us in a place in our life, there are those moments we come in the journey of our life where we realize, hey, I, something's missing. Yeah. 
Uh, it's the same as it was, remember, for, for uh, the, the man who comes to Jesus, Nicodemus, by night and says to him, and he's a teacher, rabbi, what must I do to have eternal life? Something's not right. Something's missing. My status, my money, my religion is not sufficient. What is missing? And what is missing in those religious men's life is Bartimaeus' life and every other person born since the fall of Adam and Eve is that, that element of the God-changed heart in life where Christ comes in and the Holy Spirit penetrates your life and you become a new creation in Christ Jesus. Rich young ruler knows something's wrong. Bartimaeus knows something's wrong. And they both have an opportunity for a face-to-face -face confrontation with the Son of God. Rich young ruler in his conversation goes a little different. Jesus is asking the rich young ruler, what can I do for you? Well, you know, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus goes to this little list. You, well, you keep the law. Well, I've done that all my youth. But Jesus is not saying the law saves you. Any more than when he told the rich young ruler to go sell all you've got and give your money to the poor and follow, and follow me. That wasn't going to save him. What is going to save Bartimaeus, what is going to save you, what saves me, what saves any person is a realization that our only hope, our only avenue, the only way to avoid the collision of death, hell, and the grave is through Jesus Christ, who came and offered himself to sacrifice for our sins. And when Jesus addresses him, and speaks to the rich young ruler about selling his stuff, he's not saying that this will save you. Basically, he's saying, you need to repent. It's the same message for all of us. And the idea is, what do I need to repent of if I'm the rich young ruler? Putting my confidence in my stature, in my youth, in my wealth, or anything else. My hope is not going to be found there. Jesus approaches the rich young ruler on the basis of who's his God? Who's running your life? Who's in charge? And when he says to him, money, the rich young ruler says, hold on, I can't, I can't give up. I can't let that go. I can't, I can't give up my, status, my, my stature, my status, and you know what people think about me. I, I, in other words, he chose to embrace what he thought was bringing him happiness and joy. And if he'd only used a little bit of common sense, he would have stopped for a moment and said, I wouldn't even be talking to Jesus if I'd had happiness and joy. Because he doesn't have any. And money has not provided any. And the status has not provided any. The other extreme, hold these men side by side. Bartimaeus hadn't got anything. The problem with the rich young ruler is he doesn't realize he doesn't have anything either. He may have possessions. He have, may have popularity. He may have uh, the, uh, the opinion of good people around him. But hey, and without Christ, we all have nothing. Without Christ, all have sinned. All have fallen short of the glory of God. We all stand on the same common ground. Rich, poor, uh, old, young, all of us. We're on equal footing here. We all need grace. We all need God. We all need hope. We all need deliverance. Rich young ruler walks away very sorrowful. Bartimaeus doesn't walk away sorrowful. His life has changed because he saw the truth of the moment that I need something I cannot do for myself. And in his blindness, he saw what the rich young ruler could not see. Value systems perhaps changed through the desperation of, of Bartimaeus' life. Who knows what it is, but two men side by side, they both stand there with an opportunity to seize the moment and see God do something in your life. And one doesn't see God do anything in his life, and the other one sees a miraculous deliverance in his life. Now, I believe every one of us have opportunities that are divine opportunities that God gives us. I believe all the time God is presenting to his children, especially those who know him, opportunities. And too often we're too consumed. Maybe it's like the rich young ruler thinking that something that the Lord is telling us to lay down is what's really making us happy when we're not happy at all. Maybe we're trying to embrace something that God's trying to tell us. That's the very thing that's causing you, your, your, your idea about that issue, about that thing, about that sin, about that. That's what's hindering you and your walk with me. You need to lay that down. You need, you need to hang that up. It's, you're done with that. And we're still, oh, like it's, it's what I need. To, I can't stop or I can't help it. Or I, that's just the way I am. And that's what, it's just part of my life. And this is the way I was born. And they, they don't seize this opportunity. They don't grab the opportunity. They don't take the opportunity. And here's God. I believe with each of us today, no matter what our situation may be, lost, saved, believer, or unbeliever, God's op offering, God's speaking, God's ministering, God's calling, God's convicting, God's dealing with us. 
Bartimaeus responds to the opportunity and he takes the opportunity. The rich young ruler doesn't. How about you today? What's God saying? How's God leading? What's God dealing? What are you saying back to God? Maybe there's an opportunity and perhaps in your mind it doesn't look like an opportunity. In your mind it looks like you're going to have to give up something or you're going to have to stop something or you're going to have to start something. And you're so busy deliberating all that junk, you miss Jesus. And you miss the opportunity to experience his fellowship. You miss the opportunity to experience his life. You miss the opportunity to enjoy the fullness that he has for you. You don't capitalize on the opportunity that's standing right before you. And here's Bartimaeus though, Lord have mercy on me. Could well be today that you know that you stand right now in your life without Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You know what it means, God's already talked to you. He's already been speaking, he's been convicting you. And there's not too many people that come into a worship service somewhere who has, God has not already been dealing with them. On some level, they may not understand it all, but yet the conviction, that sweet calling and moving and drawing of the Holy Spirit, that wooing has been taking place in their mind and in their heart. Might be late at night when they're staring at the ceiling wondering what it's all about. Could be early in the morning, who knows, but God's been dealing with you. There's the opportunity, the presence of God is signaled by the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Don't miss the opportunity. Some of you may be a Christian, you're a believer, you've, you've made a commitment in your life, but yet God's trying to take you to the next level. Or God's trying to get you to be a part of some ministry or get you involved in something or lead out in something. And you're not responding because you don't see the opportunity as an opportunity. When in reality, it's a tremendous and glorious opportunity. What are you going to do with that? The door's open. Here's Jesus. By the way, again, as I, let me say it again. He's not coming by this way again. He's headed for the cross. Bartimaeus needs to seize this moment while he has it. He needs to take the opportunity. And I don't know, somehow we feel that I can just put God off and I'll get a chance later on. As Christians, I believe it's very dangerous to put God off when the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about something. That's when you need to seize that opportunity and take advantage of what God's doing. First thing you have to do is capitalize. Here's this opportunity, don't let it slip by you. The second thing is you have to minimize the negative clatter, the voices that are around you, because there's always those, those things. Here's Bartimaeus, he's obviously known, he's the, as I said, he's referred to as he's the blind man, like people in the community know who he is. But he is not ashamed at this point to stand up and start making some noise to get the attention of the Savior who's passing by. Now the difference between Bartimaeus and a lot of folks is, Bartimaeus is not too proud to admit he's got a need. He's not too proud to admit, I have a problem I can't solve, I have a situation going on in my life, I have a sin I can't overcome, there's something, I need help. Here's the opportunity and it will soon walk by him if he does not do something radical right now. And he begins to cry out, have mercy upon me, have mercy upon me. I know I'm in need, I want you to know I'm in need. <laughs> Hear what I'm saying, Lord Jesus. Now, the crowd's reaction is different from Jesus' reaction. The crowd now begins to react in a different way. It says there that many rebuked him. Many told him sternly to be quiet. He's the outcast. He's kind of like the Zacchaeus in town. He's outside of town, Bartimaeus. He wants the Lord's attention. Why, is it, why are they correcting him? Well, this is the Lord Jesus, you know. He's going by and, you know, he, he, he's on his way. Their minds are to set up his kingdom in Jerusalem, realizing he's going to die in Jerusalem. And I'm sure they're the religious there that, you know, that were really ticked off when they heard Bartimaeus because Bartimaeus is referring to Jesus as the son of David. That's a messianic title. That's, the, that's like saying, here comes, this, here comes the salvation of all men. Here comes the Son of God. Here comes the Savior. Now that kind of bothered some of those guys, so they, they don't like to hear that kind of noise. Let, let's just shut him up. But whatever it was, the crowd for the most part had stereotyped Bartimaeus, we don't have time for you. We'll toss some coins your way, be quiet. We just really don't have time to get involved in your life, so would you just mind being, sh just shut up, in other words? There are always going to be the opinions of other people when you decide that you're going to do something for the glory of God or you're going to be something for the glory of God or you're going to give your life to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. There's always, sometimes there are internal voices that say, yeah, you don't do that, you know. What are people going to think? What are people going to say? What are people going to do? 
And then there's always the, the, those who worry about, well, if I step out and, and you know, and, and do something that uh, people might think I'm something I'm not or whatever it might be, and, and they miss the opportunity. And then there's the voices on the outside, not the internal ones. The internal ones, not only yours, sometimes it's the devil's. And don't do that when people think about you. And then there's those external things that people, there's just always going to be people who criticize you anytime you step forward for anything. Get used to it. I have a lot of critics, but so do you. Some may not be as vocal, but they're still there. You have critics. You have people that don't like you. You have people that are opposed to your commitments, opposed to your convictions, opposed to your standards. There's always going to be those people. They'll say something like, oh, you just think you're better than us. Nobody said anybody to think about being better, better than anybody else. But yet the critics say it. Oh, you just want to judge everybody. I just want to live for Jesus. You tell everybody Jesus saves. Oh, you're just judging everybody. There's the critics. You know, it took me a few years in ministry to realize that the best thing I can do in regard to my critics is ignore them. Ignore them. I found out the more I tried to do to satisfy my critics, they never got satisfied. Ever. Ever. <laughs> The Bible says, as much as possible, live at peace with all men. But some people just, you know, they just think they have the lifelong ministry of being the critic. You know, let's just criticize it. Let's just talk about it. Let's just complain about it. Let's just whine about it. Hey, there's going to be people around you like that. And you have to do the same thing as Bartimaeus. You have to ignore them. In fact, I've always enjoyed some of the sports stories that you, know, that you see about the guy who nobody said was going to be anything and you're too short or you're not fast enough or you're not tall enough. Kind of, kind of the Drew Brees stories, you know, of New Orleans Saints. He's too short to be a quarterback. You know, you can't do that. And, he's not going to, those, and, and to hear their stories, well, those are the things that, 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 that he, they say propelled me. Those are the things that pushed me. Those are the things that, you know, I had to get out there and, and prove it even more. If anything, you let your critics do, at least let them propel you, all right? forward. Let it, let it be the things that motivate you for greatness, for the glory of God. There's a lot of people tell you it'll never work. I celebrate today my spiritual birthday. I've been saved a long, long time. All right. That, I mean, a long time. It was on September 27th. I gave my life to Jesus in 1973. Some of you weren't even thought of back in then. Amen. That's old, isn't it? I was three. Not really. I remember after giving my life to Jesus, uh, I, 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 on Sunday after church one day, the following week after I gave my life to Christ that Thursday night and I was baptized Sunday. And I, I remember uh, Sunday afternoon thinking, you know, I, uh, I know where all my old friends are hanging out today because we always went out the same, we always went to the same place on Sunday and just kind of chilled out and tried to come down from that miserable high of a weekend we experienced and getting partying all week long. So I said, I'm going to go over there and talk to him. And I, I went over there and I walked into the house. Hey, Arp, where have you been this weekend? I said, man, I got, some, I got saved. Well, you talk about silence. There's about 12 people in the room. Just stone cold silence. So I gave my life to Jesus this weekend. I just want to come over and tell you guys what, what I've done and what God has done for me and let you know that you know, he can do the same thing for you. Oh, boy, the critics fired up. You know, I always... <laughs> One of my biggest fears before I got saved was if I give my life to Jesus, really, all my friends are going to, you know, all my friends, you know, I, I, here's what I said. I have to leave all my friends. I found out if I did that, I didn't have to leave one of them. They all left me. <laughs> so they, they all departed. They all departed with the difference. Oh, that's all. Oh, that's, that's nice for you. I guess everybody needs a little crutch in life, you know. One said, it will never last. You're going to be back here in the circle smoking dope with us in another three weeks. Well, wherever you are today... <laughs> and whatever you're doing today, <laughs> I'm still living for Jesus. Hallelujah. You just keep on keeping on. And if that does anything, let it be the impetus, the motive, the, 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 the push that you need to keep on pressing forth. Bartimaeus doesn't shut up. He just gets louder. He said, he cried more loudly. Son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David, have mercy upon me. Listen, we need to cry out. When we're in trouble, we need to cry out. If we're in a conflict, we need to cry out. If we're in a difficulty, we need to cry out. We need to cry out when we're not in a difficulty, all right? But the last thing we need to do is shut up to please the critics because they'll never be pleased. 
Don't quiet. Don't get quiet. God called me after this service this morning at the other camp. He said, listen, you know, just as, as, an, as an act of, uh, you know, of commitment to the Lord, he said, I started taking my Bible and it to work and I read it at lunch. And he said, he said, now other Christians are starting to come out of the woodwork. Amen. You know, they're starting to bring their Bible to work. Now we're talking about Jesus at work. You might be the person who creates an environment that literally influences other Christians to finally make their stand and get bold and get on, get excited and get on, get on fire for the Lord. But listen, move forward, no matter what the critics say. Seize the opportunity. Don't worry about the complainers. Don't be limited by the negative criticism of other people. Just go do what God called you to do. Be what God called you to do. The third thing about here against all odds is exercise the faith that God's given you. Those who let him tell him sternly to be quiet, but he kept crying out all the more, son of David, have mercy upon me. I believe with all my heart that every person whom the word goes out to, as the gospel goes out to, also the Bible says faith comes by hearing, right? I believe that God gives to each of you and to me as well when the word goes forth a measure of faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. It may just be a mustard seed of faith, but that is enough to move the mountains in your life. When, the word, when this word goes out today, you have the faith you need to exercise to go to Jesus, to call out to Jesus, to claim Jesus, to walk with Jesus. Don't ever sit back and say, I know what's before me, but I just don't have enough faith. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible tells that faith comes from the Son of God. And the word of God from the Son of God is preached to our hearts and lives, that faith comes. And it's that moment when we need to embrace the word and receive the word and respond to the word. And like Bartimaeus, stand up and say, Jesus, here I am. Here I am. I need, a, I need a confrontation with you. I, I need a conversation, not a confrontation. I need to get with you. I need to hear from you. Have mercy on me. I mean, he's just stepping out boldly. And there are times we just have to get aggressive. There are times when the pressure's on, when the difficulty's come, and it seems like the weight of the world is against us. That's the moment you need to push back in grace and move towards Jesus. You'll find what you need to reach to him and find him in that moment. I love Jeremiah 33, 3. It's God's phone number, by the way, if you hadn't got it on your quick dial. It says, call unto me and I will show you great and mighty things which thou knowest not. The reason people don't see the great and mighty things, they don't call. They worry about their problems. They talk to everybody about their problems. They whine about their problems and they'll complain about their problems. But very few people take the moment to say, I need to get on my face with this problem and talk to God about it. Philippians 4, 6, do not be anxious about things. Quit worrying, but in everything... By prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. This is what Bartimaeus is doing. Boldly petitioning, boldly calling out, boldly speaking. And it's not the boldness, by the way, that gets Jesus' attention. That's just, a, that's just a fruit. That's a manifestation of the faith that's in his heart that Jesus is the answer. And one of the greatest evidences of our faith and that we really do believe Jesus is the answer is that we pray. Prayerlessness is unbelief in action. We'll be doing about 10 weeks on prayer coming up here in just a couple Sundays. But it's, it's, a, it's a call to get back to let's trust God. Let's believe God. Let's hear from God. Let's get to God. Let's go to God. Let's find God. Let's get God in on this situation. Let's see what God's doing and involve him in our situation. Whatever it takes, let's seek God's face. He moves out. And it's a matter of faith. It's a matter of simplicity. And it says that what he does here, and, and the passage reads it like this. And, and, and he, Jesus stops and he says, bring him to me. And he came near and Jesus asked him, what do you want? You're making all this noise. What do you want? And th there is a time, I think, that once we made our noise, we need to stop and tell Jesus what we want. <laughs> tell him what you want. And he says, to receive my sight. He said, okay, receive your sight. Your faith, your coming to me, your trust in me, your belief in me has made you well. Now, it's Jesus that made him well, obviously. But what initiated that? That commitment to, to want to, to seize and capitalize on this opportunity, to ignore the, those who would criticize you because you're stepping out and to step out in faith and believe what God is saying to you and trust him. I love what it says there. And it says, and then what did he do? It says, then Bartimaeus received his sight and he followed the Lord and he glorified the Lord and the others glorified God with him. What's the evidence that I'm following? I'm glorifying. 
There's a lot of people today, and I tell you, I, as a pastor, as a teacher and a preacher of the Word of God, I get extremely frustrated many occasions with, with our country and with Christianity in this Western Hemisphere. Because we have thousands, millions upon millions of people, you know. We, see, we saw it demonstrated, you know, with the pontiff's visit this week, you know. But millions of people across the globe who say they're Christians, they get all excited when an event happens, but just come and, what about today? Are you going to follow Jesus today? Well, what about tomorrow? Will you follow Jesus tomorrow? What about this weekend when everybody else is going to go out and get drunk and bury the Lord? Are you going to go get drunk with them or are you going to praise the Lord and live for Jesus? You know? We live in this party culture and this party society that when it comes time for the party, everybody forsakes following Jesus and let's go be a part of what the world's got going and let's get in on the activity and let's do what they're doing. Oh, but Sunday we might be in church because we're Christians. That might be one Sunday of the year. It might be Christmas, but hey, I'm in church. Nobody seems to, everybody wants to say they're Christians, but there's not a lot of people like Bartimaeus who will follow Jesus. But isn't that the, the essence of Christianity when Jesus turned to the crowd and said, follow me. Deny yourself, take up the cross, follow me. How do I know I'm a Christian? I'm following Jesus. How do you know you're a Christian? Well, I was baptized. Well, you got wet. You know, I prayed a prayer. Was that the last one? That should have been the series of the first that set off multitudes of prayers. So that was the last one. Something happened that didn't happen, all right? What happened is pseudo-Christianity. Well, I, I've, I've attended church, and I'm even regular. Well, good. But are you a follower of Jesus Christ? You know, where's the commitment to Christ? It says he followed Jesus. And, that, that's, and then it says, and he glorified Jesus. That's what usually happens if you really follow, and you start glorifying the Bible said, whatever you eat to drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. In other words, he's living his life with a reverence and honor and, and, and respect towards God. That's the way he lives his life. And it says he caused other people to also begin to glorify God as well. So here he is. He's walking in what God's called him to. And what's happening is other people are getting excited and other people's lives are being changed. I remember reading a story about a missionary in a very isolated area of Africa. And he was looking for a certain kind of people who had a certain blindness because it could be corrected by a surgical procedure. And he'd just done an operation on a man whose sight was restored. Several days after the operation was done, the man just disappeared, all right, from, from, the, from the little clinic area that they were, they were working out of. And he just, I mean, he didn't, didn't show up. Everybody's concerned about his well-being and what happened to him, where he went. A few days later, uh, there's a knock on the clinic door, and the missionary opens the door, and here's that man that had been blind. And he's standing there, and he's holding a rope. And holding on to that rope, at the other end of the rope, were 10 more blind people. That's the great picture of what it means to really follow Jesus. God's done something in me. Man, can he do something in you. If God can do this for me, imagine what he's going to do for you. God's no respecter of persons, so I know if he did it for me, he'll do it for you. He can save me, he can save anybody. Change me, he can change anybody. Restore my life, restore anybody. Restore your marriage, restore anybody's marriage. Fill your life with grace. Hey, he can fill anybody's life with grace. Set you free from the penalty and the power of sin. He can set anybody free. I believe genuine faith is contagious faith. Amen. It just can't wait to involve somebody else. We need to stop settling for less. We need to set... Stop listening to the critics. We need not to listen and settle down and, and kind of be like everybody else is, you know, and kind of muddle through life. We just need to be what God's called to. We don't survive, we thrive. We choose to live the fullness of life. You capitalize on the opportunity that's before you. You minimize the voices that are clattering around you, and then you exercise the faith that God's given you and see what God's going to do in your life. Let's stand for a word of prayer. Father, your word is true.